So I'm going to just spend the last sort of 10 minutes of this going through a few thoughts of sort of my nearly 25 years. As I, I was a little stunned when I, when, I, when I thought about that. Nearly 25 years of working in global health. So, and this is particularly aimed at those of you at the start of your careers. So first I encourage you to take some risks, right? You're going to have moments in your career and you think, should I really do that? And I encourage you to do it. For me, that moment of risk taking came when I was 24 years old. Yes, I did used to have a lot of hair. It was curly and it was not gray. This is me at 24 years old filtering water looking for cryptosporidium in a slum in, in Fortaleza, Brazil. And I moved to Brazil. I was 24 years old. I did not speak a word of Portuguese. I did not know anything about cryptosporidium. And I have never been so nervous in my entire life as when my professor from medical school came down with me for a week and left me there for a year. And yet it changed my life. But there's some risks you shouldn't take. Don't ever, wherever you are in the world, get in a car and not put a seatbelt on. And if there isn't one in a car, just tell them you'll go another day when they can find you at the car with a seatbelt, right? It's only good if you get to do it another day. Never drive outside a city at night. When I were moved to Mozambique, one thing Steve said to me, we have a rule, I expect you to follow it. You will not drive outside of Shamoyo at night. And I continue to follow that rule to this day, and I still hear Steve's voice in my head when I think about it. Learn a language. This is life changing. I'm sure looking around this audience, I'm actually preaching to the choir here. But learning Portuguese, moving to Brazil, and spending a year where I didn't speak English changed my life, as you heard. Then I got sucked into working at HII. <laughs> Be careful about learning. No. But seriously, learning a language is very important. If you can learn more than one, all the better. Learn, being, being multilingual has been a big part of my professional career. Um, and it has given me the ability to work all over the world in, in ways that I think are, are very fun and very valuable. Learn about where you're working. So one of the things I try and do, and I have to say, I've been worse at this in recent years. I can barely seem to get on the plane, let alone get on the plane with a book to read. You know, I used to, when I was at CDC, actually know my trips far enough in advance that I would get on Amazon and say, what's a book about Liberia? I'm going to Liberia, I don't know anything. And I would order a book and I would read it on the plane. And read a novel, read a history book, read something beyond just the biology and the health piece of where you're going. This is a book about Liberia, great novel for those of you that haven't read it or are working in Liberia. Get to know your colleagues and learn from them, it's sort of the obvious. So this is me out with my field team, and I learned a lot from these people. This is Aldo Lima, who led the unit, and my field nurses in, in Fortaleza in uh, 1990. Work hard, sort of obvious, and don't shy away from the difficult. Um, I nearly fainted shortly after this picture was taken. This is a placenta, and I'm teaching people how to sample a pl placenta to look for placental malaria. It was 115 Fahrenheit. Um, this placenta had been extracted at 2 in the morning. This is now 10 in the morning. I probably don't need to describe the <laughs> olfactory experience involved in doing this, um, and I, I did have to sit down shortly after this picture was taken. Do take fun time to have fun and explore. And I, it's funny, giving this talk and pr putting it together again for you all has helped me to realize that I've fallen off the wagon on some of these things, and I need to take some of these own lessons back to heart myself. I'm not doing a good enough job of this myself. But I used to. So this was me on a trip to Madagascar uh, early in my time at CDC, and I managed to go out to a lemur park. And I have to say, this was one of the funniest moments in my entire life. I love lemurs. And to have a lemur on my head was of great joy to me. Find humor in your work. Um, so I was working in Burkina Faso, and um, we were working on a draft questionnaire. And uh, <laughs> I turned around to talk to a colleague. And when I turned back around, my, uh, the, the, the local animals had decided my questionnaire was a tasty afternoon snack. <laughs> You'll find a lot of hurdles in your work, and you need to accept them with equanimity. So we had a big, big, big study in Ethiopia, 2,000 questionnaires. And the data had been entered. But I was finding all sorts of problems with the data entry. So I said, can I hack the questionnaires? I need to go over them. I expected nice stacks. And the guy came out with questionnaires. <laughs> And these were not in any particular order. Uh, let's just say that's a moment where I decided to go out, have a cup of tea, come back, breathe deeply, and then realize I was going to spend the next day organizing those questionnaires but I, before I was going to be able to answer any questions. <laughs> Read voraciously within your chosen field, of course. So for me, the last 15 years, that's reading a lot about malaria. This is an issue of supplement to a, the Tropical Medicine Journal a couple years ago. But read widely outside your chosen field. Some of your ideas are not going to come. You, it's very easy to fall into a trap. You know, you go to a conference and you go to the, the, the stuff you know. 
go to the stuff you don't know. Go to the stuff where you think ideas from something that's outside your field might transform the way you think about something. For me, I really read only two things these days, which is the New Yorker magazine that comes fairly slowly on, in, by the mail to Switzerland and the Herald Tribune. This is just an article that I happen to read about Saint Tomé that wound up, for me, producing a concept note on island eradication because this, I, I realized the sort of resources that were available out there. Again, the idea didn't come from anything that I was reading on malaria. It came from reading this article. Something totally different was about oil revenue in Saint Tomé. And I started to think about how could I capitalize on that. Right? So I just encourage you to, to, to read widely outside your field. Develop a toolbox of skills. Of course, I'm preaching to the choir here. You're here. You're developing that toolbox. For me, some of that was here. And some of that, of course, was EIS, which is a pretty good worldwide club. And although I'm no longer at CDC, it's a place I'm deeply fond of. And I do think that the Epidemic Intelligence Service was an amazing, amazing experience in terms of gaining skills. Don't shy away from leadership and management. And you can always learn and improve those skills. It's really easy to say, oh, I don't want to do that. Let someone else do that. I actually think we all have to step to the plate for that. Leadership and management is a part of life. And you can really learn skills. And I've done a lot of courses over the years, and I still feel like I have so much to learn of that. There's a Leadership and Management Institute at CDC. I spent a year-long course. I've read a lot of books. You've got to keep working at it. It's not something that comes easily, and it takes a lot of work, and you've got to keep thinking about it. Choose an important topic. Think big and be passionate about it. So for me, of course, 15 years of my life has been this. It's been malaria. But choose something you really care about and that really matters and you think is going to make a big difference to the world. Believe in the power of communities and trust the people you're trying to help. So this is a wonderful book that I learned about when I was actually here and working at Harborview Hospital in an outpatient clinic called Building Communities from the Inside Out. And the, 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 the concept of this book, if those of you that know it, it's really wonderful, is that we often go into a community and say, what's wrong? Do a diagnostic and figure out what needs fixing. Instead of going into a community and saying, what are the strengths here and how do we capitalize on those and bring those strengths out for the community to get where it wants to go. Be flexible, learn to compromise, and work in partnership. Just speaking to your introduction, and I like that network up there, because that's what modern life is like. So I showed this as part of my T3 campaign. So this is my daily life, right? This is just trying to get the T3 campaign off the ground, right? Global health is pretty complicated today. One of the great things in global health is how many partners there are. One of the problems in global health is how many partners there are, right? It, it's pretty complicated out there. It's a pretty complicated architecture, right? And it can be frustrating at times, and we should admit that. But we should also realize that you can go very far in those partnerships and that different partners have different strengths and you can get an awful lot out of having all of these people in your court. Don't be afraid to step outside your usual role. So for me, being 10 years at CDC, and some of you in the audience know this and also experience this, I'm looking at Manoj back there. So these are covers from the Emergency Infectious Disease Journal and uh, some of the things that happened. So SARS, 9-11, anthrax. I spent 10 years at CDC working on malaria, but I also spent a month working on SARS in Asia. I spent two weeks in New York after 9-11. I spent two weeks working on the anthrax. When you get those opportunities and someone asks you to do something, just do it. There are amazing ways to learn something outside your field. The two most important phrases in life, which are I don't know and I'm sorry, and I'm still floored at how many people seem unable to utter those two sentences. I say these every day, day in, day out, to my staff, to people above me, below me, doesn't matter. I'm sorry, I should have done that differently. Or, you know, I actually don't know the answer to that. But I'm so struck how hard it is for people to say that. Sand and rocks and rocks and sand. I wanted to do an image for this, but I thought my art was so bad that I wouldn't torture you trying to come up with an image. But the point here is that there's a lot of tiny things that you can do in life. And if you do all those tiny things first, you can't put the rocks in. If you fill a jar with sand and then try and fit the rocks in, you can't fit them in. If you do the big things first, if you turn your computer on in the morning and spend two hours working on a paper before you look at your email, then you can get the little things that are in around the edges, right? You can add sand to the rocks that are in there, and it'll fit. It'll fit around the edges. It is super hard to do, and I need to remind myself of this because I get caught in this trap all the time. <laughs> For those of you that are clinicians, and that's not everyone in the room, and I realize that, or nurses, or if you have a clinical practice, I encourage you to keep doing it. In the 10 years I was at CDC, I was able to volunteer every Friday at a clinic where I worked in an immigrant clinic. The thing I most miss in my job in Switzerland is my inability to practice clinical medicine. I feel so disconnected from the point of why I got into this in the first place. So if you can have that opportunity and you can do both of those things and you are, 
do you have a clinical background? I encourage you to figure out a way to keep doing it. Nurture those under you and put yourself out of a job. That's one of the great joys of the world, right? Franco Diambo, one of my favorite people, this is someone I worked with on a clinical trial in Kenya who has risen to be the head of the demographic and health uh, system set out, out there and got his PhD as part of the project we did together and is just a wonderful person. Try and see the bigger picture. So sometimes we're working on one piece of the puzzle. So this is a slide that I developed many years ago. Some of you have seen this, but you know, some of you are gonna work on research, some on policy, some on program limitations, some on monitoring and evaluation. But realize whatever piece of the puzzle you're working on, that whole cycle needs to work. And you need to stand back sometimes and stand back from what you're doing and sort of figure out how does that fit into the bigger picture. Sometimes it's really easy to get lost. Use the global health architecture out there. So here's a really complicated part of the global health architecture. I'm not sure I can recommend it to everybody. Um, it is the World Health Organization. It is a really complicated place. It's got 193 member states. It's got six regional offices. It's an institution that was born in a time where there really was only one institution in global health, and it's now one of thousands, right? But it is a place that matters because at the end of the day, it is a neutral, honest broker that convenes experts to set health policy and that a lot of countries turn to. So whether it's using this piece of the global health architecture or other pieces, how do you, how do you put those pieces together and use them to your best advantage? I say to you, many of you are out there generating evidence realize that that evidence is really important to us and that we use all the evidence that emerges from research to ultimately make recommendations, policy recommendations to countries. Everyone, I don't have a graphic for this, you know, everyone needs to help raise money and be an advocate for what we're doing. The fact is there's not enough money in global health, whether it's your piece of the puzzle or globally, we all need to get out there and be advocates. Some of it's not that savory, it's not that fun to really go to a meeting and try and make the pitch for why we need $15 billion to the global fund. But it needs to be done, and we all need to figure out what role we're playing in that. We can't shy away from it. We all have to, we all have to do our bit. Find a champion for your cause if you can. Boy, howdy, did we get lucky with malaria. For those of you that don't know, this is Mr. Ray Chambers. He's a truly, truly wonderful man. He is the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Malaria, or was. Now he's the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Health-Related Millennium Development Goals. Slightly broader hat. Um, this is a man who uh, spent his life in business, uh, sold his company 25 years ago, and spent the last 25 years as a philanthropist, and has been an incredible champion, and can open doors that I can't open. And if you have that sort of person, and you can find those people to help champion your cause, that can change everything for you overnight. Find a physical activity that you enjoy and do it wherever your travels take you. It is so easy to get lost in the sea of travel and global health and to, here we're supposed to be healthy in global health and it's amazing how unhealthy that lifestyle can become very quickly. For me, that swimming, this is an amazing swimming pool. I had never been to Australia and I was, got the pleasure of going in October for a meeting in Sydney and someone said, you have to go out to this pool. So every morning at six o'clock, I got out there and tried a different pool in Sydney. Um, 50 meter pools all over the city. And at six in the morning, they're full. That's the other amazing thing. This is um, icebergs. Uh, there's a reason it's called icebergs. Uh, this is the ocean and they fill that pool every, every Wednesday with new ocean water. I didn't know that, I went on Thursday. I was a little concerned that the person going in ahead of me was wearing a wetsuit. <laughs> I was blue after my 30 minutes in this pool, but it was a beautiful pool. I had never seen a pool like this. It's very funny, I actually sent this picture as a Blackberry photo to my wife who said, please do come home, we do love you. <laughs> and that's the segue into my last slide for today. You gotta find a work-life balance that suits you and it's super hard and it's different for different people. But I do encourage you, for me, it certainly is my family. Thanks very much.